Oh, so glad to see y'all again. It seems like a long time. But um, you probably heard somebody say as you, um, uh, uh, in, you know, in church circles that the Bible is God's love letter to you, right? Have you heard that? Everybody's heard that, right? And so it, whether that is a true statement or not really depends on what you mean by it. If you mean that the Bible tells us of God's love for us as, as for humanity or for you as an individual, yes, this is a true statement. But uh, the problem is with a love letter kind of mentality, you have, uh, you, if you think about a, a, the normal way that you think about a, a love letter, like from a husband to a wife or to a, girl, a guy to a girlfriend, uh, who is the subject of that letter? Normally you, right? It's like the, a classic love letter would be a man telling a woman all the things that he loves about her. Like, you complete me, like Tom Cruise said in Jerry Maguire, if you've ever seen that movie. <laughs> so a love letter is mostly about the recipient. And if that's the way you think about it, then um, the Bible is not a love letter with us at the center. Because the Bible's main subject is God. And it reveals him to us, and we have to keep that firmly in mind uh, for uh, when we open its pages because if we don't think about it correctly and we're always looking for what it says just to me, then you're going to get confused and frustrated with trying to understand what it says. The Bible is not always about us, but it is always about him, and without that focus, when you read especially the Old Testament, um, you can get lost reading about a bunch of guys with hard names and places that don't exist anymore and battles that you don't really care about because it seems very separated from our modern world and the motivation to read the, in those places isn't so great um, because if you're looking for something about you in those stories, you're not going to find it, at least not right on the surface. So you have to have a right perspective when you read the scriptures away from you and on to God. And if there's one thing you're going to hear me say over and over and over is when you read the Bible, you need to ask yourself a singular question. And, um, and if you've heard me, you've probably heard me say it before if you've been in here. And that question is, what do I learn about God from this? What do I learn about God from this? And so whether you're reading prophecy or epistles or history or poetry, um, you know, only when you get this question right can then you accurately apply to yourself. So I've got to ask myself, whatever I'm reading, what do I learn about God from this? And when I get, when I've learned something about God, then I apply it to myself. Now, so far in Quarterstone, if you've been with us for the last several sessions, it's been pretty easy to read the books that we've covered, and the Ephesians, Philippians, James most recently Galatians, it's pretty easy to find God on those pages because he's basically in every verse. His name is there, his activity is there, and um, it wasn't hard. But we are shifting backwards hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years uh, to the study of the book of Esther. And instead of it being a letter of instruction uh, to new believers who, who've just become Christians and are understanding who Christ is, this is not that. This is categorized as a book of history. And in addition to that, like Sandy just said, it doesn't mention the name of God a single time. There's no reference to the Most High, to the Sovereign One, to the Almighty. There's not a prophet. There's not a vision. There's not a dream or a miracle. No mention of the law of God or a temple or Jerusalem, any of the things that you normally expect to see in Old Testament writing. So how do we answer this question? What do I learn about God from this when we don't even see his name or any of his overt activity at all? Well, therein lies the interesting uh, part of this book and because, you know, we really love to gravitate toward the stories of God's miraculous interventions, right? When we're reading the Old Testament especially, you know, fire from heaven, raising people from the dead, um, walking through the sea on dry land, a lot of... Uh, plagues and stuff. We like to read those stories, but the truth is that here in the 21st century life, it can put, we could probably relate to what was going on in the book of Esther, maybe more so than any of those stories that we kind of like to read about. And that's specifically because uh, it isn't full of obvious interventions by God. He is unseen, as the title of our study is going to tell us, because isn't it true when you look around your life, 
Isn't it true that we look around this world and we do wonder where God is? I mean, his, his activity is not on the front page of your newsfeed. It just isn't there. And uh, most of us would probably say, too, that we have not experienced a firsthand miracle um, in our lives, especially not like those that we read in the Old Testament. Um, we haven't seen them. He does seem to be unseen. But we should never take that to mean that he is uninvolved because he is always involved in our lives. And so it's with that in mind, and that kind of lays the foundation, we're going to open the book of Esther and we're going to spend a whole lot of weeks going through this story really slowly. And mostly what we'll see is the, the setting and the background of Esther is mostly the same old, same old. It is just ordinary uh, things happening without any supernatural super interventions, just the regular political, social things happening uh, that defy explanation, that people don't understand what's going on. But uh, with careful scrutiny, as we go through this book, we are really going to see that God is at work. He is just off stage, just out of view, bringing about events in a way that do reveal his sovereign control. So before we jump into this ancient story and look for some modern impact, I want to kind of orient ourselves because, you know, we get, need to know where we are before we know we can get where we're going. So it's kind of like if you were my age, when you were, when I was in high school, you used to go to the mall every weekend, right? <laughs> you know, that's where we hung out. And uh, so if you went to the mall, you first thing you would do, you would go in and you would look at this giant map, be a little red dot, and it had three words on it. What three words were those? Yeah. You are here. You are here. And, just, and, you, and so that's what we're going to do. We're going to spend the first part of our little lesson here, and we're going to orient you with some you are here signs so, so we will know where we are. And that was especially you had to know to get to that map if you're in a new place. And in our study here, we are in a different place. We're in a different time. We're in a different location, and we're a different part of God's story. So we need to orient ourselves a little bit so we can be sure of where we're going. So the first thing I want to do is, uh, first, you are here universally. Now, remember that the Bible is a singular story. It is played out over thousands of years and in thousands of people's lives, but it's built around a singular message, and that is the message of reconciliation. Look at this verse in Colossians. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, that's Christ, and through Christ to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. So uh, uh, normally we think about reconciliation as just between God and humanity, but it's much, much bigger than that. Um, do you see that he says here he's reconciling all things and all things means all things and so much bigger than we normally think so our first year all here son is in the universe right so redemption is on a cosmic scale yes it involves us yes that you know god's love centers on us but the weight of sin impacted everything right here from this globe that you can't even see on this this map here uh, to everything that has ever been created and Romans 8 21 says that all creation groans and that is that all creation suffers a common misery that of being in a state of pain and disorder due to the impact of sin and the full work of re redemption includes the reversal the complete reversal of the curse and this is the main thing to keep in mind whenever you read the scriptures redemption and reconciliation. God is at work to undo the effects of sin. And Jesus and his work on the cross, like that Colossians verse said, are the center of the story. See, we have to see every part of the biblical story in light of this. And really from Genesis chapter 12 all through the end to the end of the Old Test Testament, Israel takes center stage in the program as God promises to bless all nations and all people through them by raising up a Messiah. And so this is very, very important to remember and keep in mind when we study Esther because Haman's plot to destroy Israel 
is a threat to something much bigger than just a small nation. This is not one a powerful nation trying to subdue a tiny little nation. This is an assault on God and the redemption that God promised to bring through Christ, which is our eternal hope. And so as we study Esther, and really old, any Old Testament narrative, you have to see it in light of God's universal uh, purpose and to bring about reconciliation, establish a righteous kingdom. Otherwise, we miss God's hand of grace of what he's really doing in the story. So you are here universally. Then you are here biblically. So we have to get our bearings a little bit about where we are in the, the unfolding of the scripture because Old Testament is not laid out chronologically, right? So the books of history kind of are all uh, put together. You know, the uh, first and second Kings and Chronicles, they kind of re repeat each other. And then Ezra, Me Nehemiah, and Esther, this, that's the books, some of the books of the history. But the prophets are all the way over at the end. So if you're reading the Old Testament like you're reading a, a, a book, <coughs> a normal book, thinking it's one thing right after the other, you'll get confused that some of the uh, prophets and where they go with the history because it's not laid out chronological, chronologically. So I want you to take a quick look at this. Um, timeline. You will not be tested on this. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff on here, but this is just a quick timeline of where we are so we can kind of see where we are. And so we start back over here at King Josiah. He's an unfamiliar king to a lot of people, but this, he is at the end of the, uh, the, the Kings, and, uh, Kings and Chronicles, and this is way, way, way past David and Solomon and the splitting of the nation of Israel. It's, it's uh, if you go all the way back, Israel was together, and then there was a split, and ten tribes went to the north, and two tribes went to the south, and by this time we get to Josiah, the ten tribes have been dispersed and are off the scene. And so, in fact, Josiah is the last good king of the southern kingdom, which is the ki kingdom of Judah, and uh, he becomes king when he's eight years old, and he reigns for 31 years, and he... Uh, the temple at the time when he was king has fallen into di disrepair because of idolatry and so he decides that he wants to leave a, to have it refurbished and bring it back up the way it, it, it should be and so what happens in the process is they find a, a copy of the book of the law of Moses and they bring it out and they read it and he falls under conviction and starts a revival uh, in the nation of of Judah, and so he, uh, it, it's not a gr it's great ending to his life as the beginning, but he did a lot of good in returning Judah to a focus on God, but uh, it was like the last call of Judah back to the Lord. Now, it, of course, it only lasted as long as he was alive. When he died, uh, they reverted back to idolatry, and there's four more kings that fall in here that are not up here before Nebuchadnezzar comes to end overruns Jerusalem, tears down the temple, tears down the walls, and hauls, uh, either kills the people that are there or hauls them back into slavery. And you'll see down here the prophets that are writing during this time is Jeremiah. He's the one that's just telling them uh, destruction is coming. You need to repent. And then you recognize Daniel down here too. He and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, are part of the people who are carried off into slavery by Nebuchadnezzar. And so the Jews who, who survived this assault ended up back in, under, in Babylonian captivity. And uh, that was prophesied by Jeremiah in, in chapter 23. And they're held as slaves in a foreign land. And um, so uh, the book of Daniel and the book of Jeremiah come way before we get to Esther. Now, decades later, we skip over Belshazzar. I'll talk about him later. But um, Cyrus is another king. He's a Persian king who comes in and takes over the Babylonian Empire. And, and uh, that was foretold in the, by, uh, by the prophet Isaiah. And in the first year of his reign, he, he uh, issued a decree to rebuild Jerusalem. And in somewhat of a unique declaration, he abolished all slavery in his whole kingdom. Kind of a very forward-thinking guy at the time. And what one of the things that this, uh, this that law did was allow the Jews to return back to Jerusalem. You know, the books of Nehemiah and Esther tell the story of the rebuilding of the wall and the rebuilding of the temple. 
And, but however, despite their newfound freedom to go back to Jerusalem, only about 50,000 Jews decided to do it. Most of them stayed put in Persia. And uh, so that brings us all the way up to here where Esther is. This is your, you are here, son, to where we are. And so if you were living in a Jew in Esther's time, you would have had very little to hold on to as far as your faith, at least from a worldly perspective. You know, the, king, the great kingdom that God had established under David and promised to keep going seemed very, very far away. Northern kingdom of Israel, it was dispersed and gone. And by the time Esther, uh, uh, of Esther, Judah had been in captivity a very long time. And the promise that God would send a Messiah and that he would resurrect the kingdom and that he would reestablish it seemed really, really hard to believe for these Jews. And it was more like they felt forgotten and abandoned by God. And it's into this seemingly hopeless situation that God uh, raises up a very unlikely deliverer in Esther. Before we get to the actual uh, story, uh, we need one more. You are here, son. So you are here universally. You are here biblically. And then you are here historically. Now, uh, this gets us in right into the text of Esther. So let's jump into verse 1. This is what happened during the time of Xerxes. Your Bible might say Ahasuerus, as that's what the Jews called him. But the Xerxes, who ruled over 127 provinces stretching from India to Cush. Now, that's a boring verse, right? Just, just keep going. But there's actually a lot we can learn from this verse right here about our first character in the story, who is Xerxes. And it says, verse 1, that the Persian Empire stretches from India to Cush. And Cush is modern-day Ethiopia. It was a massive, massive empire that he ruled. Uh, one of the largest land empires that has ever existed, certainly at, up to this time it was. And you'll see here that our Yuhar here, his sign is Susa. This is the southern capital of, the, of, the, of Persia. Uh, there was four capitals. This was the, where they stayed during the summer. And our whole drama will uh, play out here in Susa, you see, it's very far away from Jerusalem, so to get back to your homeland, if you were going to go back and live in Jerusalem, this is a long haul, so you can understand why maybe some of them said, yeah, we'll just stay put. And uh, so, uh, so anyway, so we know that he is a significant, Xerxes was a significant figure in, uh, old, in history, and we learn a lot about him from a book called The History of the Persian Wars, rich, written by a Greek historian. And he took great interest in Xerxes because Xerxes tried unsuccessfully to invade Greece. And Greece is this little bitty grave right over here. And so you can see this massive empire and that he could have just ignored Greece over here, but Xerxes came, came completely focused on overtaking Greece. And this is actually very important to the story. It's, it's the setup for the whole thing. Instead, uh, so in, uh, his unsuccessful invasion, and we'll talk about more that, about that in a couple of weeks, his unsuccessful invasion is what Xerxes is most known for. And the significance of this failed invasion here is one of the most decisive turning points in history. Without the Greek triumph over the Persian Empire, Western civilization, as we know it, probably would not have developed. developed. Uh, while Persians continued to exist uh, throughout Xerxes' life and Esther's life, um, his defeat by the Greeks began the downfall of Persia. And from that point on, there was a slow decline over the next 150 years until they became so weak that Alexander the Great came in and conquered the whole Persian Empire. And uh, he, he introduced Greek culture, Greek language, Greek uh, ideas across much of the ancient world, which set up the spreading of the gospel through what would become the Roman Empire to, throughout that empire and beyond. So, really important, but back to the story. Uh, verse 2 and 3, uh, he ruled this massive empire. And verse 2 and 3 of, of, our, of chapter 1 tells us that in the third year of his, his time as king, that he invited his personal officials, he invited military leaders, princes, and nobles from across the realm to this huge gathering with the probable intention of enticing them to join this military campaign against Greece. And that's basically what verse 2 and 3 say. And then we go to verse 4, 
it says, for a full 180 days, he displayed the vast wealth of his kingdom and the splendor and glory of his majesty. Now, some people say, wow, 180 days, six months party, but that's not exactly what it says. There's two things going on in these verses here. So this wasn't the, the, the first part up here. The first 180 days was an assembly comprised of showing off Persia's military and probably included this strategic planning session for the invasion of Greece. Then verse 5 says, when these days were over, the king gave a banquet lasting seven days in the enclosed garden of the king's palace for all the people from the least to the greatest who were in the citadel of Susa. Now this is where the party is, and um, it lasts a week, and uh, the next couple of verses get, uh, give some detail of what his palace looked like and what the party looked like, and I'll come back to those in a minute. But there was lots of pomp and circumstances and beautiful things. And verse 8 says, there was a lot of drinking. By the, time, by the king's command, each guest was allowed to drink in his own way, for the king instructed all the wine stewards to serve each man whatever he wished. And so this is a massive drunken party. But for Persians, there was more to it than just drinking because alcohol was part of a decision-making process crazy as that seems, they would all get drunk, and they thought that they could get in touch with the spirit world, alcohol, spirits, that's where that comes from, <laughs> um, and they believed that the spirits would guide them to make good decisions, and so you can imagine what the party was like after seven days of drinking and all the things that were going on, um, and so then we get to our second person in the story, who is Vashti. Queen Vashti also gave a banquet for the women in the royal palace of King Xerxes. And now she's the queen. Now I wanted to talk a little bit about her uh, tonight before we finish up. Um, but Vashti, a lot in the last you know, few decades has been made about Vashti, about being the first feminist, right? Basically, no man's going to tell me what to do, that kind of attitude. But uh, that, according to the out writings outside of scripture, She's not that. She doesn't care about anybody except herself. She's not out for social change or caring about anybody else. She was all about herself. And so if you just use some reasoning and back up in history a little bit and know something about the world that, that you know, per, what Persia was like, it would seem so very unusual, at least it did to me, for her to say a flat no to a king like that and not, not know what's coming next. <laughs> I mean, I mean... If you know anything about how Esther became queen, you know women's rights just did not exist during this time. And later in the story, you'll see that Esther's even nervous about going in to ask a question of Xerxes, let alone refusing him. So you just didn't say no to the king during this time, uh, man or woman. You just didn't. And, and especially you're not going to say no to a powerful, arrogant, self-indulgent, and now drunken king like him. So I did a fair amount of reading because I would speak my interest. Who is she? What, what, what would make her be so bold? And uh, I found some thoughts. Now these are sources are not from the Bible, so we can't be dogmatic about it because we really don't know a lot about her. But Jewish tradition does add a little bit of color to her life that I thought I would share with you. So if you ever hear anybody say, well, she's the first feminist and put modern sensibilities or modern ideas onto her, you'll have another framework to think about it. Um, the first thing we do know is Vashti. The word Vashti means desired or best, and so um, which leads a lot of people to believe that this was a, a title given to his favorite wife, you know, as opposed to her real name. And that's possible since there isn't any record outside of the Bible that a, he was married to anyone named Vashti. Um, but some other sources imply that Vashti could have been a descendant of King Belshazzar that you saw in the timeline a minute ago. Uh, and you might remember him from the book of Daniel, if you've ever studied Daniel. And he, so uh, Belshazzar was from the line of Nebuchadnezzar. And so Belshazzar's downfall was recorded in Daniel 5 when he was killed by Darius, who is Xerxes' father. And so some believe that instead of killing all of the family members, including Vashti, um, that she was preserved and spared, presumably, for some political advantage. Basically, she would be given to Xerxes later as a, the first trophy wife. Um, 
literally. <laughs> and if this has any merit, then that would explain why Vashti had some sense of entitlement, that she had some uh, a royal background or a privileged background that made her not want to just act like any other uh, lady in his group of women. Um, it could be help us understand this awkward relationship that they may have had from the beginning and, and hint at a relationship that had a lot of friction, you know, frenemies as we would call them today maybe. Um, I mean, people who were closely aligned with her now husband orchestrated the killing of her family. So it's not going to be a lot of fun at Thanksgiving, right? <laughs> so, but whatever the state of their relationship, we really don't know a lot about her. So all that, a lot of that is conjecture. But keep in mind that marriage back then is nothing like we think about marriage in uh, the United States today. Uh, people didn't marry for love. Uh, that was not even a consideration, especially for a king. They would marry specifically and have, you know, be given in union for some political advantage, usually for a king. So if you know the story, we're only going to see Vashti for a second, but her role in the drama is, un uh, in the, this drama unfolding is really pivotal. But that's as far as we're going today. We'll pick up next week. This is just kind of set the setting and introduce our first two people in the story. And um, we'll get to the conflict ne next week. But that doesn't mean there's not anything to learn from this section. Um, I'm going to uh, kind of try to give you an application every week because sometimes it's harder to pick out of a historical narrative. So this section of the story, the application comes by way of comparison. And if you look at verses 6 and 7 that we skipped over, you see all this beautiful stuff that, uh, that was displayed uh, at this party showing the glory and might of Persia. We got white linen and cords of linen, and purple material and silver and marble and mosaics and goblets of gold. Notice that they're not all matching. Each one is different, so it's very opulent, very beautiful. And so what I want to take time to highlight right here at the end of our time together is this comparison of Xerxes' king to our king. Um, there will always be rulers like Xerxes around. Uh, it might not be so obvious because they're not palaces and things like this so much anymore, uh, but uh, it's still around. It doesn't even have to be a ruler. I mean, have you looked on Pinterest? Opulence everywhere, right? We just think came through Christmas. Have you seen some of those decorations? <laughs> I mean, really. But, um, you know, if you have people who command wealth, influence, and fame, what follows usually is adoration. Somebody's worshiping them. Now, we don't call it that, but that's really what it is. Um, you know, if you've ever worn a t-shirt with somebody's picture or name on it, um, that could be a form of worship. I mean, you're aligning yourself with that person and telling everyone about it. So we have to be careful. Uh, you see the marks of just devotion to powerful people all over the place. The political process in the entertainment world, sports fields all over the place, throngs of people cheering and applauding. Um, but this passage of scripture reminds us that there's so much more fuel for the adoration of God when we realize that the king of Persia and, um, and leaders like him all the way up into our time only have temporary influence. Temporary influence. Yes, there are kings and queens still around today. Literal ones like the fan fair around Queen Elizabeth's funeral last fall. Or less literally, kings and queens, the powerful and influential in our culture. Hollywood, college football, we just had that Monday night, right? <laughs> but none of those are in any way equal to the king of kings. And we need to be very conscious of who we give our affections to. Because there's only one deserving of it. Revelation 4 and 5 tell us that he alone is worthy to receive glory and honor and power. And while all of Persia was, is subject to Xerxes, all of creation is at the feet of Christ. Xerxes sat on a temporary th throne in Susa, and Christ sits on an eternal one at the right hand of the Father. And he is seated, as Ephesians chapter 1 says, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God has placed all things, all things under Christ's feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. That's pretty comprehensive, right? Xerxes had vast wealth and at the time looked like what was unlimited resources. But every ruler from past, 
present and in the future has limitations. There are set periods of time, set boundaries of influence, limited resources to control, but not for God. Not for God. He put those boundaries in place, but he himself is bound by nothing. And from the wealth of his kingdom, he doesn't just keep it for himself. He generously gives to us, his followers, the everlasting riches of his glory. Colossians 1.27, to them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches Glorious riches of this mystery. What are those glorious riches? Which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And then Ephesians 3, 16 and 17, Paul prays that out of his glorious riches that God will strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And lastly, just as all were invited to uh, the king's banquet in Esther Day, that was in verse 5, so we're all invited to receive the riches of God's glory today. A lot of people are going to refuse. They don't want anything to do with it, but it's still open to all for now. And the invitation is to participate in a banquet feast and a kingdom where even creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children. Of God. So if you are worried about what's going on in the world or you're worried about what's going on in your individual life, remember that even though we can't see how it works out and it's hard to trace the movement of movements of God's hand sometimes, the message of Esther and the message of the whole Bible is that there is an eternal king and he is in control. And you can trust him even when he's unseen. Psalm 90 verse 2 says, before the mountains you were born, were born and you brought forth the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting you are God. Amen? God, we just thank you that we don't have to worry about who's in control. My goodness, this world is so crazy, but we know that you sit on an eternal throne and you are unmoved by it all and you have a plan that you are working out in this world, in our culture, and in our very lives. And we thank you for that. We thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for uh, your, your son who does rule and reign. And we can trust you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.